um, to alternatives for financing your early stage venture. Our presenter today is Mr. Lou Farina. He is a business analyst with the Maricopa um, Small Business Development Center, and he specializes in technology commercialization. So, Lou, I will um, turn it over to you. I would like to say, everyone, he is going to give options to ask questions after each section. If you will put your um, questions in the chat, I will make sure that they get answered. Um, so... Um, Cindy, I can't, um, if you could put your question in the chat, that would be great. Um, thank you. And we will go ahead and get started. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Lou Farina from the SBDC. Um, today, we're going to talk about some options for early stage financing. Um, one of the questions that usually comes up really early is, will I get a copy of these slides? And I, uh, we will be sharing them as well as a recorded uh, version of this, of this webinar. So um, don't need to take copious notes. So today um, we're gonna talk about early stage uh, funding. And uh, for any of, any of you who have been involved in trying to raise money for your venture, you'll know that the first money that you uh, that you raise is really kind of the trickiest. It's the, the earlier, the harder. Um, there's a lot of different ways uh, you can find funding, different various organizations and people, and there's resources. Finding what's right for you is a difficult question, where to start, because all of this takes time and it's very hard to do all of it. So you kind of you kind of got to pick one or two and then and kind of work with it. Um, we've I've designed this webinar. We've designed this webinar to be um, insightful for you to, to really talk about uh, various options. Um, today, uh, we broke this into two webinars. Last year, we did it as a single webinar, and it was just way too much information. And so we broke it up into two uh, webinars. Um, the uh, today, we're going to talk about you know the value of self funding and what that means, grants. We're gonna talk about friends and family. You probably heard that term. We're gonna talk about a lot of terms today for folks who have not maybe raised early stage equity or funding. And uh, we'll, so I'll, I'll highlight, highlight terms as we go through. We're gonna talk a little bit about debt. I'm not a debt specialist. I'll talk more about it. We've got some debt specialists here, but how it fits in. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about crowdfunding. That's always an interesting topic. And then we'll finish with uh, incubators and accelerators. Um, so part two, uh, of this, um, series will, um, take place on March 22nd at, uh, 10 AM. And we have, and I thought I put a slide in here with a bitly link. And, uh, so I might've pulled up the wrong deck and I apologize for that. Um, but the, the, the second part, if you can register under the, uh, uh, at the SBDC, same place you registered for this on our calendar. Um, we'll talk about competitions and some of the benefits and the funding that can come along with competitions, SBIRs, STTRs, which are technology grants. Then we'll get into angel investors, strategic investors, a little bit on venture capital, a little more on vent corporate ventures. And so there's kind of a sequence to this. I'll show you. I think it comes up in the next slide, but I think right now, um, just introduce myself a little bit more formally. Uh, Lou Farina, I've been here at the center for about four four years now, but my background is in corporate ventures. Um, so I've I've worked uh, on technology type businesses, uh, funding them, um, scouting them uh, in in terms of ventures and mergers, acquisitions, uh, large uh, you know large scale investments. I, I also, you know, when I when I left a private industry, I I, I um, participated as an angel investor here in town. Um, so I've got a lot of experience in the early stage uh, capital, also, and I actually review SBIRs for the National Science Foundation, so I'm real familiar with that program. So that's me. I work um, almost exclusively with technology clients, clients who have some kind of innovation, but we've got other other counselors that work with uh, folks in, in more general industries. Okay, 
Oh, here's the uh, give me. I give you the two minute commercial on uh, the SBDC. Who we are for those of you who don't know, we're part of a national network. SBDC is a national program, so there are SBDCs in every state. And they're broken down typically by geography, by regions, or centers. Where I'm in the Maricopa Center. Um, Maricopa Center. Yeah, includes Maricopa County, but there's 10 centers here in Arizona. There, you know, you can go to Prescott, you can go to Yuma, Tucson, Sholo, uh, Flagstaff, etc. Um, so we've got resources spread all throughout the state. Uh, we do counseling. Counseling we talk is really kind of advising, and it's no fee, one on one, um, which proves to be very valuable to a lot of clients. We do training, and this is considered training. We've got some tools and resources that you can utilize through our um, through our service including market research and business planning tools. Um, things that we cover, uh, again, this slide, again, I, I put the wrong, I pulled the wrong deck up, but that's okay. I, I made some changes. Disaster loan assistance I put on the bottom. We did a lot of that during the pandemic. That's not our primary um, function, but we do, do a lot of lending, lender readiness preparation. So if you need commercial loan or um, an SBA loan, we can help you get ready uh, for for that loan and and really help you maybe connect you with lenders. We we have uh, skill and tools for financial review. We could do marketing assessments and planning. Help you buy sell exit business strategies, uh, manufacturing technology commercialization is where I am. Uh, we have specialists in export and international trade. So if you're exporting. Um, it, we've got some folks that can help you. And then we've got a sister organization called uh, Apex, which was formerly known as PTAC, and they exclusively focus on government contracting. So if you're if you are an existing business and you're looking for government contracts, um, that would be another service that we could provide to you. So, okay, I got a poll here. And before this poll, I want to ask one other question. So we were, you know, we pre-pandemic. We, um, the SBDC, had done a lot of web, not webinars, we call them workshops, and we did them in person. We didn't do them online. And so we're talking about getting back to that now that things have kind of normalized. And we're trying to take a poll uh, just of, of those, those of you that are online today that chose to join us virtually. Um, if this was offered, um, you know, in person at a central location, uh, would you have attended? Uh, what what was what your preference? So if you could just put, you know, Karen's going to just look at the chat. If you could just put your preference in there for us, it just helps us understand kind of where our clientele is today. And um, we would like to get back to do them in person, but certainly uh, these webinars are very convenient. Okay, so that's the first question. The second question, just a, a poll uh, regarding your activity, which vehicles has your company used to attempt to raise capital? And Karen is going to run a poll that should pop up and you'll be able to choose. Can they choose more than one? That is a very good question and one I don't know the answer to. Okay. So, well, choose 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 what best, best fits. If you can choose more than one, choose more than one because that's probably more more uh, common. All right. So we'll let this run. How long do we let this run for, Karen? Um, maybe another um, 30 seconds. Oh, oh, that's it. Looks she's like she's saying that chat is disabled. Um, so I'm not sure why that is. Here we go. I think also we've, uh, okay. Okay. I think that that should be it. Um, okay. So most folks- 100% answered. So. Okay. So, all right, uh, self-funding, uh, that's what, exactly what I would expect. Some grants, some debt, some crowdfunding. So interesting. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you very much. It helps me understand kind of who's in the audience and what, you know, kind of your experience. Um, um, we were just told that it only allowed one answer. So. Okay. My apologies. Well, well maybe next time we can try to figure out how to do that. Um, okay. So there's, there is kind of a, a, 
a progression to early stage funding. And I call this equity because this is typically the equity track. It doesn't necessarily have to be equity, but most of it is equity. Um, and so um, you hear different terms, seed, ide ideation, startup, early expansion, series A, series B. So there's a lot of terminology that gets thrown out. It's not really consistent. What I'll, I'll show you here is kind of, you know, the stages of development. And this is the way Lou sees the world in the terms that I use. So in the ideation stage, typically the investment um, is yourself. And we, we, and I'll talk more about this. And we always ask, well, what, you know, if you're, if you're, if the self is the first investor in the business, who's the second investor? And we always say self. So it's important that you invest in your own business. Uh, um, again, we're going to talk in detail about these different topics. So in the, I call pre I'll call it pre-seed stage. There are areas like friends and family, crowdfunding, accelerators, competitions, grants, SBIRs. This is early stage funding. It's a lot about what we're going to talk about today. But the important thing about that is you really can't start to talk to angel investors, who is a term that you've probably heard, um, or strategic investors, until you've kind of gone through this, this mechanism here, typically. And then really, corporate venture and venture capital, you really can't talk to venture capital or even maybe corporate venture until you've got some validation on the funding side, maybe some angels that have invested, and then you know, you've know you done some of this pre-seed funding here too. So it's important. Um, and then you get to private equity and IPOs, and that's much later, and that's institutional money. That's after venture capital. Most folks don't get there, don't need to get there to have a successful business. And it's typically an area that I don't cover in my in my webinars. So here's kind of the typical progression. Again, we're going to focus down here at the at the early stages for this particular webinar. Um, okay, so self-funding. You know, and and I and I this is from the perspective of you, you know, at some point um, you may be going out to find a partner, an investor, either semi-professional or not. And what's important is you are always the first money in, right? You, that, and that's a term that you'll hear from investors. Um, what it means is exactly what it says, is that the, you need to be invested in your company financially to some degree. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But self-financing demonstrates commitment, right? It, it to, to, you know, again, looking at it from the, perspective of an investor and really maybe anybody um, you know if you're going to use personal funds it's got you got to be very careful about how you do it um, but the important point here is a sustainable business shouldn't require ongoing self-funding so there are other options to get you off the ground that you can utilize including you know funding yourself out of profits at some point right maybe you don't need to take on extra uh, burden of 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 in either investors or grants or anything else. So that's important. But there is something if you're going to be a you know an entrepreneur and you're going to invest yourself, your own money and your own time. Um, you know, time. If you're looking at it from an investment perspective, from an investor, they don't count your time. They expect your time. They expect that you're working feverishly on on your on your uh, startup, on your early stage venture. Um, but they do count money. So they'll tell you how much money have you put in. If you say, well, I did 20 hours and or 100 hours and my, you know, $50 an hour. And they say, no, no, no. How much hard cash have you put in? So cash is the important uh, metric here. But if you're going to put your time in and your cash, there's a term called bootstrapping. You may have heard of it. You may not have. Bootstrapping is the process of starting, growing a company with limited resources, right? So do more, do less, do more with less. So the extent that you can show um, how creative and innovative you can be with constrained funding, uh, you know, the, the better off you will be in general and the better off you will look to a potential investor. So um, they love it. Boots, they love, you know, investors and, and people who want to join your business love folks who know how to be resourceful. A lot of times resourcefulness is born out of just the constraint of resources, right? We, we get creative and we get inventive when we have no other avenue. And um, 
So this is a kind of a forcing function to a certain extent, but very important. There's also this theory of relative burden. And I've got two pictures here, and one is beer and pizza, and the other is an expensive trip around the world, right? So you, as an investor, if I'm looking at the money that you put in, it's got to be relative to your means. Okay, so, um, you know, if, and I give the example of, um, I had a, a, I was working with a startup venture, and, the, and they put about $50,000 into this uh, venture. And, um, and that's a lot, but not a ton by investor centers. But you know what, these guys, this team, they were working the Amazon, um, the Amazon uh, 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. shift in the morning and running their business, their startup the rest of the day. And so that was a ton of effort, a ton of money to them. So that's the beer and pizza, right? They, they, these guys, they didn't have a lot, but relative to what they had, they had put a significant amount of their money in. On the other hand, you know, you look at um, very well-heeled uh, folks who maybe um, have have the resources, and you know, twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars to them is just another vacation or two, and it really doesn't matter. So, you know, does you know how much skin do they have in the game? That's another term that you'll you'll hear. So, anyway, important. So, it doesn't mean you have to put a ton of money in, but it has to be relative to your to your means to be important. Um, so sources of, you know, funding and I mean, those of you, you know, the majority of you have done this, this funding, um, yourself, um, right. Payday income, right. You know, any surplus out of your income that you can divert very, very common for entrepreneurs to be working a day job or some kind of hourly paid job while they're working on their business. Um, uh, I've got, you know, I've got, uh, entrepreneurs that drive DoorDash at night, whatever they need to do to, to make it work. You know, you may have the luxury of having had some savings or some windfall. Um, you know, uh, you know, we, uh, we often talk to clients about tapping into the equity in their home. I mean, this is a, this is a good time uh, to, uh, at least in, in the local market with the prices going up where the equity is built, this is an option to, for a debt, a debt vehicle using your house. And then you can actually tap into a 401 k okay, 401k retirement type savings. Um, a lot of folks that are come off the corporate ladder, corporate train that want to start up a business will tap into their 401k. You know, it's 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 there for your retirement, but it is a source of income. So, whoops, sorry. And what I'll do is I'm going to end each of these sections with kind of a recap about what's the good and the bad. Because with all of this, uh, with all of these different topics, there's pluses and minuses. It's it, There's no one size fits all. So, you know, for self-funding, what's really nice about it? You've got control, right? You don't, you're not giving up any equity and or ownership. That's what the term non-dilutive means. Non-dilutive is the term that says, I'm not diluting my ownership. Um, forces you to bootstrap, forces you to be creative in thinking, adds credibility because you're putting your own money in. And, you know, you can save a lot of time, right? You don't have to, you're not out um, working um, with anybody else or doing any kind of grants or loan application or anything. You just fund it yourself. On the other side, you know, this is kind of self-explanatory. There's personal risk from a financial standpoint. Um, there's stress, there's anxiety. You know, you got to watch your family assets. And if you're self-funding, always you're really going to have at some point, typically, you're going to limit your growth, so you you can't rely on it as a as a um, as a long term strategy. Unless, you're, of course, you're there's an exception to that rule. So, anyway, so I'm going to pause. And um, any question? Any you know? I see there's a lot going into the chat. Any questions in the chat, Karen, about self funding? This is probably the most intuitive piece that you know we will talk about um there is a question if you use your 401k do you still pay the penalty for early distributions i am not a tax person but i believe that to be true i don't think there's anything that says if you use it for your startup that um you're not going to be taxed um, and there's another question. Um, startup debt load ratio should be under a certain percentage. What does Lou advise on that, especially when increasing risk with an HE loan? 
Oh, uh, I see that. I actually, I got. I let me let me close that. Um, let's let's hold that question. Let's come back to that because we're going to talk about debt here um, in a couple of different sections. So, hang on to that one. Thank you. Any more? Good. Okay. Uh, okay. My so my 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 favorite subject, least favorite subject, however you want to say it, is grants. Right. We just went through um, a period like no other in this country where there was a ton of money being provided by the government, um, and in the form of grants. Right. You know, you had PPP, you had IDLE, which is a loan. Uh, but other type of grants to help keep us afloat. Um, so that happened. And I think people have gotten used to the fact that the you know, government was there to provide funding. Now, if you were a CARES Act recipient, you will know if you're a startup, you did not, you weren't really eligible for much, right? It was for existing businesses. So you know, that, that, that was important. But there are grants that are available at the, at the state, federal, and local level. There's lots of different things. One of the things that's important is a lot of these grants are, are um, often targeted to nonprofits. So if you are for-profit business and you're not a 501c3, you're typically excluded. Um, it takes time and it takes effort to not only find these grants, to apply to these grants, okay? Um, you know, time to find them, writing the grant, and then you know, waiting for your de decision on the grant. So it's a long, can be a laborious process. Um, you know, it's typically inadequate funding to fund your entire business. So you can't really count on grants to to be the the funding mechanism for your business. The SBA, the government, really does not provide grants to start and expand a business per se. You know, we've got SBIRs. We're going to talk about um, the next, uh, you know, in, in the next uh, series. Um, they're specialized and they're a big chunk of money, but it's still really not enough for these businesses to, to really um, uh, utilize fully. Um, so, again, message here, not a lot of free money from the government to start a business. You can go look for grants. Uh, it's going to take you time. It's going to take you effort. Think about some other things. In a grant, um, so I, I'll give you a, you know one catch-all kind of uh, uh, grant portals, grants.gov. These are federal grants, right? They're, again, state and local grants, which are more fragmented and kind of harder to find. But if you went to grants.gov, you, you can find potential grants. Um, there's, you know, pre-award phase where the, the funding opportunities are, are let. And there's an application review, there's an award, and then there's a post award where you got to implement report and close it out. So um, there's administrative time also on top of grants. They don't necessarily just hand you a check. Yeah, you got that reporting mechanism. So um, really short segment on grants. I wanted to mention them. I, you know, I, I often have to, you know, talk to my clients when they come in about, you know, leading with grants and and giving them kind of you know what what what's real about um, the ability to to find I would call free money um, to to start their business. So again, grants uh, you get cash, non dilutive. Another that term again, non dilutive, right? If you get a grant, they typically don't take any ownership. Um, it provides visibility, so it, you may get visibility uh, in a you know in 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 your area of expertise there may be a foundation that focuses on i don't know if you're trying to cure cancer or you're trying to clean water um, that may provide other opportunities so it is a visibility mechanism um, a lot of these grants they're discretionary you can have discretionary use which is nice not all but some uh, and it could be used for emergency funding that we've talked about but again on the on the kind of the downside there's time um, there's lots of time. There's grant writing expertise. If you you can always go out and hire a grant writer. Um, not necessarily depending on that grant. It depend it it a lot of times it just doesn't pay the economics um, with your you know your ability to actually get those grants. It just doesn't not cost effective. 
There's reporting requirements. Again, it's not sustainable for your business. They come in small increments. I mean, there might be city grants that may be $500 grant, $1,000 grant. I mean, that's a nice chunk of change, but it's really, you know, if you're starting a business, a real business, that's not a lot of money. And it's, and one thing I didn't mention is competitive, right? So it's not like, you know, somebody puts out a, you know, solicitation for a grant that everybody gets funded. It's, it's competitive, you know, is it the right subject? Is it written well, um, et cetera. So I will pause there and see if there's any questions on grants. Sorry. Um, it wasn't a question about, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I said I was muted. Okay. Um, it's not a question about grants. It was one that came in late on the okay. last portion. In the case of self-funding for an LLC, can the LLC reimburse you later? Uh, you can loan money to the LLC, if that's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a possibility. But, you know, if you've got you know, if you go, if you have an LLC and then you go to an investor, you got to, you know, show the books. If there's, if you have money that you've put in as a loan, the investor is not going to want to pay you back at that point, right? They want their money to be utilized to grow the business. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the downside of loaning money to the LLC as opposed to investing it. We have another question. Um, where is the best place to look for grant postings online and make sure it's credible? I can't, I, I gave you grants.gov. There are, you know, you can spend your, your hours just searching Google. There's tons of different places, including cities and counties, and they just show up all over the place. We've, you know, during the, during the pandemic process, we tried to keep a list of the ongoing grants, even for the pandemic money. And it was so dynamic, it just changed. And it was really hard to just maintain. Um, and then what about NGFOs? NGSOs? NGFO. F is in Frank. I have no idea what that is. I don't know what that is. I need I need a little help on that one. JT, if you could um, explain what that is. Non-government funding opportunities. Uh, Non-government funding opportunities. Well, so most of the grants are, a lot of grants are from government entities, but there are foundation grants. Again, but foundation grants are t targeted towards um, nonprofits typically. Um, so, yeah. That's it. All right. So let's move to friends and family. Okay. So this is, uh, I like this one. So um, you can go, and it's very often that folks will go to people they know whether it's family or close re or, or you know close friends or associations to to raise money for their their startup, um, it, it, in a sense it's a form of crowdfunding, right? You're you're crowdfunding. Um, you're not using a platform. We're going to talk about the platforms here in a little bit, um, but you know what 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 drives crowdfunding? Oh, what drives crowd? I'm sorry. What, dri what drives friends and family is people willing to put their trust in you um, to deliver no matter how concrete or vague your business plan may be, right? So the, the bar for, um, for investment or for providing funding is not necessarily, you know, how good is your business plan? It's how much do they love you or how much do they want you to succeed? Um, you can take a small amount of money from a lot of different family members to raise a significant overall sum done all the time but it is really the it is and i have the heart here as a symbol it is really people who love and want to support you um rather than um rather than somebody who may be more sophisticated or require more from a due diligence perspective however doesn't mean you're not going to have friends and family that aren't sophisticated and um may ask you for certain things but let's move on so there's a there's a term you'll hear and it's friends and family and we often add fools to the end of this and it's called friends families and fools and why do we do that well we talked about friends friends because they believe in you not the venture right family because they believe in you and not the venture because they they want to see you succeed 
the fool part of it comes with because they don't recognize the risk of the venture. And that's different because if you're, you know, if you're, if you're taking money from somebody who is expecting a return, um, but doesn't know how to evaluate that risk of the venture, then um, it's not necessarily your fault, but it's kind of, you know, they're kind of the, the fool, you know, it, and um, happens, happens quite often. Um, and I don't know if there's a great way around this, but um, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's hard to take money from, from folks who um, it's not hard. It's actually easy to take them, but um, it's hard to educate them on the risk of the venture if they've not done early stage investing um, before. So again, that's that, that's that fool piece of friends, family, and fools. Um, just, you know, this is kind of a note here, just uh, careful consideration, you know, be careful. Um, you want to, you know, take into consideration the motivations of your FFF, friends, family, fool investors, as well as their financial position, you know, it don't, you don't want to take half of Nana's money to kick off your company, even though she might give it to you. This is just, uh, you know, this is just more of an ethical kind of statement. Um, you know, are you going to harm your investors? You know, you know them, but if they're willing to, you know, step up and, and help you, that's great. But, you know, we don't want to take advantage of people. And I'm not, I am not, uh, I'm not advocating that, of course. So let's talk about some investment vehicle options. So the, and these, these options actually apply to other investors too, but I'll introduce them early. Um, we can talk to them, talk about them in terms of friends and family, because that's typically the earliest money that you're going to take. Um, and what you want to do is have something, some kind of instrument, I'll call it an instrument, document, that talks about what they're doing, what they're going to get for their money. Okay. So. Um, first could be a simple loan, could be a, a, a you know, you can write up a, a, a loan um, document, you know, chat GPT will do it for you, matter of fact, right? Um, simple note, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to loan you the money, okay? Um, what's the downside of that? Well, if, you know, if you loan somebody the money and you pay them back, they don't get to participate in any of the upside if this, if the evaluation is increased, which is what you're trying to do, actually. So it's a simple loan. Um, there are two other terms. We're going to talk about convertible note and a safe. Okay, and these are very commonly used instruments for early stage. So a convertible note is a loan with a provision that it turns into the into equity when there's a valuation event. So when there's a, someone that comes in and invests at a and it says your company is worth, you know, five million dollars or eight million dollars or one million dollars, whatever it is, then that note converts. So it's a loan provision with a convertible um, provision uh, on a valuation event. So it acts as debt, um, and the investor typically has the same rights as a, as a debtor uh, until an evaluation until a valuation event. So you need a valuation event to trigger the the equity piece of that. Now a safe is very similar, except it doesn't have a loan provision, right? Um, a safe just basically is an instrument that says, here's some cash. And when it converts to equity um, at the initial evaluation event, I'll convert into shares. Um, and there's and safe is is simple. Oh, I, I don't I don't remember the acronym, but it's simple. It starts with simple. So it's a fairly simple document. It's three or four pages. Um, you know, and convertible, they'll go back, you know, this loan provision. Um, typically, if a startup goes you know, fails, let's just say fails, there's no money, there's no way to pay back that loan anyway. So, I mean, you know, typically you're not paying back a loan. So that's why SAFE was invented. SAFE was invented on the West Coast, um, uh, California mostly, and we're starting to see it being used more prevalently here in Arizona and um, the rest of the country. But, uh, you know, originally um, you, you saw convertible notes. The final, and I put this in red, is equity. Valuation, where you say, okay, grandma, you know, give me, give me a hundred grand, and you're going to get ten percent of my company. Okay, um, really, really hard to do this early. You, you know, you would, you know, the reason why you do convertible under a safe is you, you don't have to make a, a valuation um, projection, not projection. You don't have to have agree on a valuation uh, 
um, to to take the money with an equity, you know, value, uh, priced round, you you do, and it's really hard when you're really that early um, to do it. And if you get it wrong, it, it can impact your next set of investors. So I kind of shy away from doing an uh, you know um, an, an equity based um, agreement during your friends and family round, but it can be done. So let's talk about friends and family round. Uh, why, why do we like it? Well, it's convenient and accessible, right? People can just write checks. You should have, you should have your investment document done though. Uh, and a good lawyer, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have chat, chat GPT do that for me, even though it probably could, um, because you really want to understand the terms of those. There's some terms in those that you're going to have to understand. And I'm not going to go into detail here and, um, they're good investment lawyers still, you know, it, it, there's a little bit of money that's involved, but it's important to do that. It's fast. It's really low cost from an investment perspective, um, and one of the things that if you're if you're a if you're a, a, a downstream investor um, looking, you know, credibility and commitment. You know, what we find as an investor is if you take your friends and family money, you take Nana's money, well, you're more likely to um, be heavily invested in the success of this company. It's it's really you know, you know when I when I as a as a as an investor would come in who doesn't know you, doesn't love you, doesn't all want, all I really want is a return. I may learn to love you later. Um, uh, you know, you don't really have any obligation to me personally. You know, it's, this is a financial arrangement, but you establish some credibility and commitment with the friends and family realm. On the, on the, on the downside of it right now, we're starting to, you got a relationship and you got business entanglement. Um, you know, do you want to mink commingle your business and your relationship? with your family, depending on, again, how they, you know, how they act and what they expect. You, you know, you could get a, uh, a built-in panel of critics, right? And that could be hard to deal with as you move forward. Um, typically, if they, you know, use a safe or, an, or a convertible note, they don't really have any voting power or any really management say um, legally in the company. But of course, that doesn't stop them from giving you their opinions. There's risk for the family unit, right? We talked about that. And again, investors at this stage aren't necessarily very savvy per se. So friends and family, any questions? Um, we just have a couple, it looks like, um, statements. Um, someone said, why Combinator SAFEs are really easy to do and are publicly available. And then said simple agreement for future equity on Thank the you. one that we couldn't remember. Thank you. Yep. Um, well, hey, hang on, hang on a second. So uh, the Y Combinator is a really good agreement, but if you're just downloading it and you really don't understand what it's in agreement, you need a law, you really need some representation to explain it to you in detail. Go ahead, Karen. Um, that's it. Okay. <laughs> good. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna shift to debt. Okay, so um, again, I'm not. I come from an equity background, so I'm not a uh, a ex banker. But we do have ex bankers at the SBDC, and we have some very, very, very good ex bankers who can help with debt acquisition. Um, and I and I have a slide here it, to talk about startup debt and kind of how it fits. You know, the 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 what you'll find, and probably those of you who have been out there and maybe even talked to potential lenders, it's really hard to get a bank loan for companies that don't have a financial track record. Um, I'm not going to say it's impossible because there's a lot of different factors, but that's a tough road to go down, right? Um, and, and I got my little picture here because I, you know, I always make fun of my banker friends. Lenders, bankers are very risk averse, right? It, the, this little picture there is the belt and suspenders kind of, you know, analogy. Um, so, um, and I'm going to show you, I'm gonna, I have a little math here. I'll show you, you know, about risk return regarding lenders versus investors. But there are, you know, for existing businesses who can qualify, there are commercial loans, there are SBA loans, there's a 7A loan for working capital um, to refinance some, you know, business debt. There's a 504 loan that existing buildings you can buy. These are good um, risk sharing SBA backed uh, uh, vehicles that you can use. I mean, there's a time to use debt in your business. There really is. It's, it's a, you know, but early is hard and it may not be the, 
may not, may not be available to you. Um, so what I want to hear, what I want to talk about, I just show some of the math between, let's say a bank loan, your banker and your angel investor, right? And so let's let's assume the bank, let's say we're, we need $100,000, okay? Uh, for the bank loan, right? It's 6% interest. Well, it's higher today, right? When I did these slides, these are left over only, geez, it's only three or four or five months. And so they're significantly higher than 6%, but it doesn't really matter. It's still the same point. Let's talk about five-year bank loan. So in five years, what does the bank get back? Well, you know, if you do an amortization schedule, you're going to get your $100,000 back and you're going to pay 16, roughly $16,000 in interest, which is their profit, right? Which is their risk-adjusted return on lending you the money, right? So now you talk to an angel investor and you want $100,000 from an angel investor. Well, an angel investor is going to look at you through the lens of, I want 10 times, I want a 10x return on my investment in five years. Okay, why is that? Well, because generally angel investors are looking at really early stage businesses and they're really risky, really risky. Um, most don't return anything. And so they need a big return on at least one to justify the, the portfolio. So in five years, if I get 10X investment, I'm giving my $100,000 back and then I'm gonna get a million dollars in, in return on this. Okay, so on the same $100,000, I got $16,000 versus a million dollars in return. Okay, what's the difference? The difference is risk, right? The angel investor is compensating themselves for the risk that they are taking. The bank is compensating itself for the risk it is taking. So the bank is not going to take a ton of risk for $16,000. Angel investors are much more willing to take a significant amount of risk because the upside is there. Okay, so that's just some basic math. Let's just talk about lending decision factors because I said it's hard and it is hard for early stage companies, especially if you don't have a financial track record. But what goes into a lending decision? What do bankers what do they, how do they think? You know, do you have experience in the industry? You know, is it, the, is it your first time? Um, do you have a, um, do you, you know, how much cash can you put down? You're, you're going to be required, you know, I think uh, SBA loans are minimum 20% down, but you're going to be required to put some cash down. How much can you put down? You know, how, you know, if you're venting something or you've got something, the product, how mature is it? Is it an early stage? Are you, is it just a patent? Is it just an idea? What's your personal credit? Probably the number one thing they'll ask you because for any early stage loan on a business, even if you've got a financial track record, they're going to ask you to personally guarantee this, this loan. So that's important. Collateral. Do you have any hard assets they can attach to? You know, do you have a building? Do you have a house? What are you, you know, do you have any machinery that they can attach to um, as part of the loan agreement? How good's your business plan? You know, especially there are some programs there are, you know, that don't, that don't require um, maybe some of the other, these other uh, uh, items. Um, and there may be just for startups. Uh, there are some, you know, how, you know, what's your business plan quality? How good is it? Um, have, how much have you put into it? And this is kind of where we work with a lot of clients also and helping them tell their story. And then what's the industry sector appetite at the time? So business, you know, banks are just like anybody other investor. They like to have a diversified portfolio. So at any one time, they may be heavy in tech, light in restaurants. They could, you know, they could be um, looking for different type of businesses to balance the portfolio. You don't know. You don't know. So anyway, that's kind of how the lenders think. Lots of different things that go into it. And at the right time, uh, you know, again, debt is a very powerful way to provide the working capital or the, the, the capital you need to grow your business at some point. So startup debt. Um, let's see. So the, the good thing about it, you get your money to grow your business. Uh, it's non, again, this term non-dilutive, right? We, we're not giving up any ownership, but we have a, we have a commitment. You can accelerate growth. You can maintain control, right? You don't have any partners. You got to report to the bank. You pay your bank. You make your payment to the bank. Bank is happy, and you can build your business credit, right? So once you once you, right, the easiest way to 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 get a loan is to not need a loan, right? So you build your business credit for folks that you can you can um, pay your money back. 
Um, again, what's the downside? They're hard to get for early stage. So now you got cash flow constraints, right? If you do get one, you got to pay it back, right? And so that's going to be a cash flow drag on your business. Uh, it's personal financial risk. Um, again, because you'll you'll be asked to personally guarantee it with, you know, either your income stream or maybe some family assets. So I know there was a question that I I kind of punted. Any other question? Can we address that question and then anything else? Um, for loan cash down requirements, does money already invested in the business count for anything? Has that been answered? Uh, it can. It can. Not always. Depends. I'll give you a, a big depends on that one. So just, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, it looks like that's it. Well, there was one from before about the, I think there's a ratio he was looking for. JT, was it JT? Um, oh, what about N NGFOs? No. Um, that's the only one I see. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Okay. So I think, you know, we're getting close to time here. I got about 15 minutes. I'm going to go through crowdfunding and then I'm going to talk about accelerators. Um, we can hang, will this, can we go on over a couple of minutes, Karen? Is that possible or will this end? No, I think we can go on. Okay. So we may go over five minutes, but I, you know, these are important subjects. I'd like to um, you get through them and then be able to answer some questions at the end. So but but if we get cut off, don't yell at me. I think that uh, we can continue. <laughs> well, I can't yell at you if we get cut off. So, okay. Um, so crowdfunding. Okay, so this is important and this is interesting. So there's two types of crowdfunding. There's non-equity crowdfunding and there's equity crowdfunding. What's the difference? Well, in non-equity crowdfunding, um, you're giving something away, um, but you're not giving uh, ownership. And for non-equity crowdfunding, it's um, more donations reward driven. Yeah, you've heard of Kickstarter, you've heard of Indiegogo. Those are more for inventions, GoFundMe's for any anything or anybody. On the equity side, I pick three that I've got a little bit of experience with: Fundable, um, Crowdfunder, WeFunder. Equity means that um, you are able to um, invest and actually take an ownership position. Equity. Um, as part of a crowdy funding platform exercise. So two different types. So um, one of the things I wanna point out, it's really important with crowdfunding is there are these platforms that are out there in both equity and non-equity side. Um, it, you know, they're platforms, but you have to provide the content, the campaign, the marketing power, the story that goes along with your, invention or your your business so this is important so the storytelling through you know creation of content video outreach social media anything that is um effort that you'll need to put in in a really big piece of making a crowdfunding campaign successful so if you're good at this it helps if you're not good at this you, you're going to need to get some help for it to be successful so let's just talk about kickstarter real quick um so it's projects, no charity or personal use. They have to approve the project. You're obligated to provide a reward. They have to be a reward of your own creation. You can't just, you know, do one thing and give out something else. Um, at like most of these crowdfunding platforms, you got to meet your fundraising goal before to receive any funding because they set a time period. Kickstarter will typically take 5%, um, and, but you're only charged if it's successful, if you meet your funding goal. And there are fee-based experts for Kickstarter, Indigo, and, and, and Indiegogo, and even these other um, equity-based that can help you with campaign strategies, storytelling. So there's always consultants right, that are available um, for fee. Let's talk about WeFunder. Let's switch. Now, this is crowdfunding for equity. Okay, so there's a, something called Reg CF, which is a provision from the SEC that about five years ago, allowed non-accredited investors with limited capital to invest in early stage companies. Before that, you had to be an accredited investor. Accredited investor is a wealth and an income and or income test that basically says 
you you are wealthy enough or you have a high enough income that you should know better. You you can take on the risk of an early stage startup. Well, with these non with this Reg CF, there's provisions here to allow non accredited, which is basically everybody else, to um, to invest in early stage companies. Um, a single purpose uh, LLC is formed. Um, put a single entry on a cap table. Why is this important? Because when you get to in, uh, other investors, um, they don't like to see a lot of people on your cap table. Your cap table is the table of everybody who owns. So you want to, you know, it's to your advantage to keep your ownership, the number of people who own individuals down because they're hard to deal with as you start to move through the investment process. So they, they form a single purpose LLC. So everybody gets together. They, they fund an LLC. The LLC shows up on your cap table. One, 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 uh, one entry. There's a lead investor that you've got to pick. Um, lead investor, there's some provisions for refunder 10% of the profit upon the initial public offering or the acquisition. Okay. Um, they charge 2% of their, on their investment side. They also charge the company 6%, 4% in cash, 2% in some kind of flavor of an equity or a warrant. So there's money, man, there's money that they take. And that's part of using the platform. I will give a little plug here, just uh, one of my clients and he allowed me to kind of um, show this. Um, his name, uh, the Col Carlosity, if you're interested in Carlosity, a little, little plug for, they are an anonymous, anonymous um, carb, purchasing site. So you can purchase uh, um, cars, vehicles anonymously. Um, if you've ever gone to a dealership or call the dealership, you've realized that you get so many different calls from these, from um, different, um, uh, once you're on their list, they never stop calling you. And also if you are an underserved um, group, a lot of times you're not treated the same way. So this this kind of levels things out. Anyway, so he he used um, WeFunder. He he raised over 160 on his first round. Um, he had to get to a fifty thousand dollar mark on his own before they would actually promote it, and he was able to do that. Is that interesting? Two thirds of his raise were from friends and family. So he used the platform actually as a friends and family way, and then about a third of the raise came from outside investors. Um, but the, what, the thing that was really important here, um, he was really good at telling a story and writing his own marketing copy and content, really, really good. Um, so um, he was a, actually able to be successful. Karen? We have several questions. So just let me know when um, you get to a spot. Yes. Okay. So let's, I got one more on fundable. So, okay. So we funder takes a percentage. Fundable is another one. They take, um, it's a flat fee. Um, so you can start at $179 for the bare bones and there's a premium package that goes up to $2,500. It's kind of an all or nothing model. Um, only accredited investors here at Fundable. So that usually means you get bigger chunks of money. Uh, the minimum commitment for an equity campaign is $1,000. There's no maximum. So um, uh, I know several companies have used Fundable. I can't say that they were successful. So it's one of these that's easy to take your money up front, sometimes hard to deliver. So, but again, companies have been successful here. So on crowdfunding, uh, let's just, let's just end here with, you know, provides accessibility to funds. Uh, there's some reduced financial risk, builds some momentum. You can test the marketability and now you're, now you're starting to put this in your, your venture in front of other folks. You can test it. And it, you know, opens access to new networks. So you find somebody on the crowdfunding site, they've got friends and they kind of build some momentum and, and access to networks. It does take time. It takes money. You know, you're not, it's not free. Uh, there are fees. Uh, you could have a failed campaign where you don't hit your funding target, you know, and you don't get anything. Money goes back to the investors. You know, you're putting your idea out there. You gotta be careful from an IP perspective. And you could get a false negative, which means that you don't really get the funding you need, but maybe it's still a good idea. Maybe you're just not telling the story in the right place, you're not telling the story the right way. I'm sorry. So uh, you got, you know, you don't want to, you know, make this the uh, the decision factors if you go forward. So go ahead, Karen. Um, our first question is: What is an example of a reward? Okay, so a reward might be the product itself. Maybe you're uh, building, um, I don't know, some kind of a coffee mug 
okay, with a certain design on it, you know, you may be giving away, you know, a free coffee mug to somebody if they, you know, if they donate to their, to your, uh, to your um, campaign. Okay. Um, let's see. JT, I don't see your question um, about debt overload ratio. Um, so if you could retype it in the chat, that would be great. Um, someone asked, how much should a company give to an advisor? Well, okay. Just in general, for an advisor, um, you can find a lot of advisors that will do it for nothing. Okay. Because they they like you, they believe in you, they want to give back. Um, and you can put them on your advisory board and you don't need to compensate them. They don't need to be a member of that of that business. Now, if there is an advisor that you think is really, really valuable and want to be part of that business, um, you can give them a half a percent, a percent in equity. I've seen that done before, but not, you know, it's not, it's more than, it's it's more the outlier than the norm to have to give equity to advisors. Okay. Um, another question, if I finance the vehicle personally, how will it show as business equipment? Mm, I don't know. I'd have, that, that's a Rick, that's a Rick and George question. I, I don't know. And then George had a statement. Um, banks typically look to debt to income ratio of one to four to one, which means for every dollar of monthly business debt, you need a dollar and 40 cents of income. Um, so that, like I said, that was just a statement. No, um, go ahead. Yeah. JT's question, um, what does Lou advise with respect to increased risk with an HE loan he referred to earlier? You know, so if you're trying to take out a business loan on your business and you don't have any assets, um, you got to personally guarantee it. It actually is easier and cheaper and faster. If you're going to pledge your, if you're going to wind up pledging your, real estate as collateral for the business loan, you might as well just skip all the business loan stuff and just take out the money on your house yourself. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of the thought process about that, you know, cause it, it, you just, it's a HELOC, you can do it really quickly, right? Today, within weeks, business loan, it's going to take you six, eight weeks or so. Um, and just to throw something in, I, I was a home equity queen um, at the bank that I was a lender for, and I could get them done in about two and a half to three weeks. So okay. um, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. Yep. Um, another question we have um, that I was emailed. I have heard in making a business plan and deciding to sell specific products, let's say on supermarket shelves, that one can project or need to project sales based on how current products are doing. How does this work? What is this very specific forecasting called? Well, it's called forecasting. Um, you know, how it works, that's a really complicated question. Honestly, what I would I would recommend is I, I sign up for our counseling, um, have and sit down with a counselor and go over your specifics. Because business planning is a very intricate and complex subject. And, you know, there's without knowing a lot more about what you're thinking about, it's hard for me to, to give you a concrete answer. And I will email you a link to sign up for counseling um, through our center. So any other okay. questions? Okay, I'm right at 11 o'clock and I got one more area to talk about, which is incubators and accelerators. So you probably heard the term, and a lot of people use them interchangeably, but they're actually pretty different from a, from a functional perspective, right? An incubator will usually cater towards early stage companies. They will find their business ideas, um, people building their company from the ground up. There's an environment of collaboration and support. Um, an accelerator is typically designed for folks that are farther along and they want to accelerate, they want to scale rapidly. And with the accelerator, mentorship comes along, capital, this is important because this is where the funding comes in and connections to investors and other business partners are part of an accelerator. So, so excuse me, I will go to this here, um, this Venn diagram, incubators and accelerators, they, they both do um, different things, 
um, incubators, typically it's fee-based, typically. It typically is an open-ended duration. You can be there for a long time. Um, there's facilities, there's some physical space, there's some rolling admission. Um, on the accelerator, growth-based, you know, payment via equity rather than fees. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. It's usually a fixed duration. You, know, you come in with a cohort. This is 12 weeks, 20 weeks, whatever. You get, you know, you get ready and you go. And, and, you know, they're they're gonna they're gonna build you up and get ready for um, to talk to so they can increase your valuation valuation to talk to investors. All of them provide some training, mentoring, business support, selective to a certain extent. Incubators are less selective. Accelerators are more selective. But the thing about accelerators is they provide seed funding typically. Incubators don't. I mean, you, usually money's going into an incubator. Accelerator typically is seed funding. Sometimes you have to pay to get into an accelerator a little bit, um, but mostly, mostly not. So they select you and then they provide some seed funding. Let's talk about that. So this is important if you get accepted to an accelerator. You're going to have, you're going to want to talk to people knowledgeable about investment documents because you are entering into a service agreement, but also an investment agreement. Um, an accelerator typically provides capital exchange for a percentage of your company. Typically, they're going to take seven to ten percent of your company. Um, some ask accelerate um, participants to pay. Most of the times, they're getting preferred stock. In your company, so they, you know, they're investing in your company. They may give you the hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, but they're going to take a significant piece of your company at a valuation, and then their idea is to increase your valuation so they can introduce you to their investors, so they can um, increase their their return on their initial investment. So, um, my 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 uh, advice here is for an accelerator, um, you know. It's sometimes they're very prestigious to get into an accelerator, but you got to know what you're getting into. And not everybody needs an accelerator per se, and not everybody wants to sign up to the terms of the accelerator. Um, um, but you need to understand what those terms are from an investment perspective. And with that, I'm two minutes over and I am willing to take some more questions. Anyone? Um, we have some thank yous coming in. Okay. Are there any questions? Oh, are all business loans for five years? No. No, they're different depending on what you use it for. They're different terms. And that's a, that was the example I gave was a term loan. A lot of folks are using a line of credit. Which doesn't have a term, right? It's it's a balance based. Um, I joined late recording. Yes, we are recording this. Um, it will be available on our website. Give me until tomorrow because I have to go in and edit um, and and put the link up on our website, which is maricopa-sbdc.com. If you go under um, if you go under training. Um, it is under recorded webinars. Any other questions? Does building small business credit help with securing loans or make a significant impact? Yes, yes, it does. Okay, great. I, oh, go ahead, Lou. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to. I, one more plug for the SBDC, our counseling experience. Again, we're we're no fee. Um, you know, typically you come in for counseling session, advising session. You know, we do an initial session. We get to know you. We series of follow on sessions every. You know, so often we check in. Um, you meet with the counselor for guidance, and we track. You know, one of the things we do here, it's very important for us, is to track your your business goals and your metrics. So um, we're very growth oriented. We want to know how many people you hired. We want to know, you know, what your sales are. We want to know how much capital is coming in and we want to help you with all that, but we track it and it's important. So counseling is by appointment only. We have an office, um, offices all over that. We're in the community college district actually, um, but we, uh, we take appointments uh, through this, this request form that 
um, link that's up here uh, that's showing. So come see us okay. if you need us. We have had a couple more questions come in. Is a business line of credit different than a business credit card? Not really. Well, um, in in the sense, I don't know, Karen. You, I know you got a banking background, so you can you can correct me on this. So, you know, a business credit card is a line of credit, but it's usually in smaller increments. I mean, you get five or ten or twenty thousand dollar. When I say a line of credit, it's like you know, you you know, you got a lot. You need a lot of working capital. You're you know, a million dollars a year in sales, and you need a you know, you need two or three hundred thousand dollars in line of credit, and that's typically I, Karen, any. Clean that up. I mean, generally, a, a credit card will have a much lower um, line of credit than a, a regular business line of credit. Um, and generally, with a business line of credit, you do have to get, um, I've been out of banking for three years, um, recertified um, every so often. Ours at my bank was every three years, you'd have to provide fi full financials to see if you still qualified for that line of credit. Generally credit cards, once you're in, you are, um, you're left at that level of credit. Um, so that, that is a big difference, but the business lines of credit can usually go much higher than a, a credit card can. Um, there is another question, um, is there a local bank that you recommend for starting a business account? I currently bank with, uh, I don't know if I can mention the bank. I don't know. Um, yeah, you can, yeah, you can, yeah. Uh, Wells Fargo, but would like more personalized service. Oh uh, boy. You know, I don't know. So the big banks, Wells Fargo, Chase, I, my experience just being working with the SBDC, they'll provide a lot of business services a lot of really kind of high-end business services catering to businesses, especially if you're small. Um, so I, I, I know I, 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 I hear you, but it's going to be hard if you're a small business to really get the attention you want, depending on your pet capital requirement. If you've got some of those capital requirements, come see us for counseling. Um, some of our bankers can provide a recommendation for you. And, and I would say also that the smaller banks, the smaller regional banks um, have a much bigger interest in dealing with the small businesses than the larger, than the larger banks do, just in my personal experience. Um, let's see, there is some networking going on here. Um, so um, what about a credit union? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not the banker. Huh? So credit union, I don't know. I have met a lot of folks a lot with a lot of good good experience at credit unions for small businesses, but okay. Um, I've not seen them do a huge amount of business lending, but um, you know that may be something that they do here in Arizona quite a bit. Um, so I think we are just about ready to wrap up. I do want to let you know if you have signed up for the second. Uh, part of this class, which is at the end of the month. Um, we are having some challenges with picking up on those attendees. So um, we are going to work on those challenges today. If we're unable to, I will send everyone an email with a new link to sign up. Um, so make sure you pay attention to that email. Um, but I'm hoping that there it will be seamless and it's just a button that wasn't clicked properly in, in the setup for the event. So just pay attention to your emails. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I, I enjoyed it. Hopefully this was uh, beneficial. Thank you very much, Lou. Thank okay. you, everybody. Okay. See ya.